My camera is frozen. Oh god. Oh no. Great way to start a live stream. <laughs> uh, it has been a while, so please bear with me while we get through, you know, technical difficulties. Okay, now my camera is weird. What is going on, camera? Okay, maybe I need to adjust the thing. Let's see. Still bad. Oh, no. Oh, Lord. What did I do? Is it me? Because I moved my camera around, so it could totally be me. Yes. Now it's frozen again. Oh, dear. See, that's what happens when you don't stream for a while. Your camera... Oh, there we go. Hey, high definition again. Hi. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't stream for a while and then you go back to streaming and nothing works. Something's ready. For example, today I couldn't find my badge and I wanted to work on the badge a little bit um, and to do some code in it. So first things first, I forgot where we stopped last time. So we need to figure that out. And second, I was moving my stuff around in the badge. So for events that I've been to, like, uh, you know, this month, so I had, I went to Octane um, and to developer day at Octane, which was great. Awesome. So a bunch of people, a lot of people got their own badge there, which was super fun and set it up there with one of the labs that we built for it. And I'm going to show, you know, you in a little bit. Uh, but first things first, hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Hi, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, please drop a hi in chat, uh, you know. How was your week? How was, you know, your few weeks? It has been a while since I live streamed anything. So I wanted to do some coding today on the badge. Uh, and for those of you that are new here, hi, I'm Jess, nice to meet you. So I've been coding a project of mine that I wanna build for a talk next year. So I'm focusing on, well, these little devices from Pymeroni. I guess I have mine here, but I don't want to move it. But I can change it later. Anyways, so I've been coding uh, this badger. It's a digital badge, and I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with it. But I actually I have an idea, but I'm trying to figure out how to do the things I want to do and make sure that I understand what is going on. So my idea would be using the badge for part of a device flow uh, and, you know, plug in, log out, and everything else. And today, since ha it has been a while, I start this a little bit earlier than my usual. So usually is 10 a.m. Uh, so I started, you know, maybe 10 minutes before 10. And I need to, you know, organize everything um, in my computer because it has been a while. Uh, I Actually, I should sh probably share my screen while I set things up. Yeah, I guess that's a good idea. What is it? I don't even remember. Oh, I have my scene set up. So, hi. So, I don't know how many of you that are here watching right now have seen this before or have watched one of my live streams before. But I've been working on these little devices here. This is the badge. So, up from here, from me, uh, you're going to see the badge. Um, this is a e-ink device. It's from a company called Pymeroni, and they do these little badgers. This one is the Badger 24, 2040W, so it has Wi-Fi capability. So if you configure the Wi-Fi settings in the badge, you can make requests through the Wi-Fi and get information from services and whatnot. And so far, if I remember correctly, let's see. I was working on a Python script, this one, TWTWI, and my idea was to make a request to Odd0 to get an access token, access token, and then make a request using that access token to a protected API. 
Last time I did this, I guess we got up to the point where we managed to get the access token run, access token uh, from odd zero. And let's see, comments, I guess I don't need this anymore. So this is data update. I should probably run this script. Oh, and I have a wipe, um, an API running here. Oh, I remember now. So yeah, okay, okay, got it. So I have this API that is protected and I made a, last time we implemented an endpoint, a new protected endpoint that would reply with a JSON object that we could use with some information. And our idea was to use that information to show on the badge. Did we get to that part? I don't know. My memory is not that great and it has been a while. Let's figure out what is going on here. Can we try running this? I guess we can, right? Let's see if it works. It still works. It could work. It's not working. <gasps> oh my God. Oh yeah. It happened to me this before. So this is usually when we get these types of error, I know, don't know exactly what the minus six means to be honest, but usually for the badge, when we get OS errors is something around having space for things or, you know, not being able to do some stuff. Um, should I run one of the other applications first? Yes, let's try running which one? The weather one. What is the weather application? W weather. Uh, so this is the weather application. Let's run that one. So what it, this is doing is making a call to this API and getting the forecast for a given latitude and longitude. Uh, this is the, I didn't change this. So this is the default latitude and longitude uh, that is set for Primaroni. If I'm not mistaken, this is United Kingdom. Might be London, I'm not quite sure, but, and so this works good. Let's try GWT again. So this means that like, so looking at this, it's make a request to the URL, it got the data, and this is the information from the forecast for that given location that I should probably look it up uh, to know exactly where it is. But anyways, and now we have like information like, uh, temperature and wind speed and whatnot. And then after that is done, it changes the information that is displayed within the badge and see here we have the 10.4 degrees Celsius. I don't know how much that is in Fahrenheit. I'm sorry. I apologize in advance. My Celsius and Fahrenheit conversion. I don't know how to do that. Uh, out of the top of my head. Uh, so wind speed of 21.4 kilometers per hour, mm -hmm. wind direction, and the last update. There was today at 2.45. Yeah, and I guess this is London too because of the time zone difference. I'm in Canada, in Toronto, and here now is 10. Oh, well, this is was 2.45 today. So it was probably earlier today somewhere. Okay, let's try to run this one again. And it's requesting the URL. Oh yes, it worked, great. I need to figure out why this script is failing on me. Sometimes it does fail this OS error and I haven't uh, had the time to investigate it, but I need to figure out eventually. So right now, what we are doing is we're requesting uh, from out zero, a access token. And the way to do this, because uh, out zero follows uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 practices, all of those good stuff. Uh, we have like this endpoint that is called OAuth slash token that we can request the access token. And how that works, I pass along the credentials that I'm not going to show here because, you know, you shouldn't be sharing like your client secrets and whatnot on the internet for everybody to see. Uh, I pass along the credentials uh, that are set inside of a file that I have here, like out zero config file. I read that file from like with, within Python in the script and I put in all these variables, put everything inside a dictionary, all the information that I need, and then use that as part of my request here. Uh, so for example, that data goes inside of this data part here from the post request. And then if everything is as it should be, like, you know, the client secret is what is LZ respecting the client ID, everything else is as it should be, uh, our zero will return, 
uh, back a access token. And that is in a JSON format or a dictionary for Python users would be the same kind of uh, structure. And I put that inside of this token data so that I can use that somewhere else. In this case, to make a request to a protected API. Let me show you this API. So this API is running on Heroku now. Uh, it's a project that I did a few years ago when I first joined Out0. And, oh, look, left the Octane. And what it does is actually, I was a sneaky. So I built this API and it has, uh, is, it is an API in a sense, but it also has a endpoint that actually renders a map for me because, you know, I was having fun with it and why not? So if I go to my browser and I keep looking to the side because my second screen is on this side uh, and that's where like I'm changing from one software to the other. So if I go to this website, it should render like this map is terribly outdated. I need to update it, put a few more places into it. So basically what happens is each of these points, pinpoints in the map are places that I give in talks at. One of the things that I want to do later is to have more information or what of the events that I went to and probably link to the events. So my friends always say that I travel a lot, so it's very hard to keep track of me <laughs> when I'm traveling. Uh, my idea would be to have a way for like my friends to see where I'm in the world uh, or where I've been and, you know, see what I've done and maybe link to my slides on the event and so on to help others find, you know, talks I've given based on the location or something like that. What else? So this is the... API has like this index endpoint, like it handles this page. Uh, so if I go to places, you're not going to see anything. If I can type, which I usually can't, because it is missing the authorization header, which makes sense because this is just a get request. It doesn't have anything in the header because it's just from the browser. Uh, so that's why I was doing that inside the badge. So in the badge, I can put in the access token in my request and get the information. So basically what it gives back to me is once I do the request with the access token is that um, JSON object, if you look here, it has is a list of objects. So it has a name. Grass is one of the cities that I've been. The location, so latitude and longitude. I could even use this in the weather app if I wanted to, for example, to get the weather forecast for that location uh, and other places like Taipei and Sao Paulo, Ribeirão Preto and so on and so forth. A lot of places in Brazil like Belo Horizonte, Brasilia and whatnot. So, so far so good. So I know how to get an access token. I know how to request uh, information from a protected endpoint in my API. I got the information back. And on the badge, what I was doing in the meantime was actually writing out access token receive token type bearer because that's how I'm going to use that access token. And now what I want to do is change all of this uh, to show some information from that JSON object. So first, this is a string. I need to turn this into a dictionary or a list of dictionaries in that case uh, on my program, and then I can do some coding in it. Now, why would this be useful? Not much, right? Uh, but this is mostly a exercise that I want to do because my intention in the long term is actually to use this badge as part of device flow. And so one of the things that I'm figuring out right now is how device flow works, even though like I read about it, I studied it a little bit. In my head, uh, I really learn once I implement something. Uh, so even as an exercise, so for example, uh, best practices are that we do not create our own JSON Web Tokens, we use services for that. Uh, Usually those services would be more secure than us trying to sign our own tokens and whatnot. Uh, cases and cases varies a lot. 
uh, of course, but my idea would be to use this exercise to learn part of the process of making requests, protected requests from the badge and get the code figured out. So now I can finally actually dive into uh, device flow because it has it is something that I haven't like completely studied or understood in a while. So today we are studying and trying to figure out how to get this done. Uh, but basically, no code has done been done so far. And before I do some code, let me just tell you something. So uh, Octane happened. Octane is the biggest event in like for Octa, our biggest identity event. Everything about identity is going to be at Octane. And for the first time this year, uh, we had a developer day at Octane, which was so exciting. Uh, one of the things that we did was actually to configure a few of these badges for attendees that were at the event. Uh, help them figure out how to do it. I even have a lab available if anyone want to check out in case you have one of these or just bought it and don't know how to set it up. Uh, it's part of our developer resources at Out Zero, And I'm going to navigate to their um, what is resources labs. So we have events labs, and this is the badge 20W, 2040W that I was mentioning. That's the one that I use. Let me drop that link in the chat in case you want to you know, see it. If I could copy, it would be like great. For some reason, I'm not typing as well here as I normally do. What is going on? I don't know. But anyways, uh, if you check it out, let me know what you thought about it. Uh, so basically, we built this thinking that people from diverse backgrounds, maybe even people that are not coding uh, per se or never touched a Pymoroni before, so they, they could set up their own badge for the first time. So basically, if you go next, so this is the introduction to how to set up your badge, what you're going to learn, this is what the badge is, and what is Tony, that's the ID that I'm using to talk to the badge. And you're going to, you, you are going to see all of these steps and there is even like a code uh, repo that you can use. Uh, most of the coding in there comes from the badge, uh, but we did update a few things just to make, you know, the badge look a little bit different from the default pattern of the badge. And, you know, it teaches you what are the buttons, how you can get everything set up and how everything works. Um, so I would love uh, if you see it, like if you look through it and you have, if you have any feedback, please DM me somewhere, Twitter, Mastodon, or, you know, whatever you fancy, what is your preferred social network. And the idea would be that people would use the badges to create their own little badge and use that for events uh, they go to. But I digress. So let's go back to the idea at hand. So I'm now going to start studying about device flow. And I should probably actually update my category of this life for, you know, something like development. Okay. Updated it. It should be updated now. And I'm going to actually probably look through the documentation from Alt Zero for it because I want to use Alt Zero, so you know, kind of makes sense in my head that I use the documentation uh, from Alt Zero to do it. Device authorization flow. Mm -hmm. I guess this is the one that I want to do. Yeah, probably. So my idea would be to implement some sort of device authorization flow to an application. I have a few Python applications, mainly Flask, and that is one that we use for Python events, to be honest. Uh, I could even probably run it. And that demonstration for Python events, uh, it is a full Flask web app. I don't know. So. Actually, you tell me, what do you think would be best? Let's run the application that I have in mind first, or should we run, read through this first? I, I'm i very indecisive today. I'm not making any decisions this early in the morning. Uh, my brain's not functioning properly. With input constraint devices, yes, this qualifies because of my, you know, 
badge that connects to the internet. Oh my God, it could just say badge. <laughs> Rather than authenticate to use it directly, the device asks the user to go to a link on their computer or smartphone and authorize the device. Good. This avoids poor user experience for devices that do not have an easy way to enter a text badge. Um, to do this, device apps use the device flow, device authorization flow, uh, ratifying on or off to. So, all off to device authorization grant. In case you want to look at this, I've been reading RFCs a lot since I joined Out Zero. Um, now, uh, it has helped me understand a bunch of the things that I work with on a daily basis, and it brings some light to you know questions I usually have. Uh, so I tend to scheme at least once each RFC, new RFC that I see. Uh, so, for example, OAuth 2 device authorization grants designed for internet connected devices, either they like a browser to perform user agent uh, based authorization or are input constrained to the extent that requiring using input, text, or other to authenticate during authorization flow is impractical. Okay, basically, if you don't have a keyboard, don't have a browser, don't know how to, don't, don't have a way to input, device flow is the way to go. So, it kind of fits really well with the badge, right? It enables, it enables OAuth clients to search device like smart TVs, media consoles, digital picture frames, printers. We could have add badges and IoT devices here um, to obtain user authorization and access protected resource by using a user agent on a separate device. Great. So the way that I thought about this was like this. I have a website that people log into and I wanted them to be able to log into the said website without necessarily using a keyboard. Um, so probably using that little badge that I have here is a way for us to do part of the device authorization grant. Uh, it's of the yeah, yeah, oh my God, IETF. I don't know how to pronounce it. I was going to do it in Portuguese, E-E-T-F, I-E-T-F. It represents the consensus of the ITF community. Good, interesting. So if you've never seen an RFC before, uh, they basically have, have the same structure. So that is the introdu introduction, which is the abstract of the, the RFC. It has a table of contents. Uh, you can read through it on like one go from top to bottom, or you can go exactly to the part that you want to read. Uh, usually what I do is I scream through whatever is being said inside of the RFC or I go exactly to the one that I want. So for example, uh, security considerations would be an interesting one to read, especially if you're security worried about, worried about security, uh, discovery metadata, device. So this is the part that I want to understand more is the device access token request, which we did access token uh, before, and device access token response. So that's what we are going to change a little bit, probably, I don't know, haven't uh, done device um, authorization flow yet, uh, per se. So let's go through that one. But basically it talks about like what, what is the thing, the terminology, the protocol, how are things are going to work and why not. So I could scroll down here. So for example, operating requirements for using authorization grant type are, these authorization grant type are, devices already connected to the internet, check. Uh, devices able to make outbound HTTPS requests, check. Devices able to display or otherwise communicate a URI uh, and code sequence to the user, check. We can update the screen to do that. Uh, and the user has a secondary device personal computer or a smartphone. That's my idea. I'm going to use my phone uh, from which they can process the request. Okay, great. Uh, I'm, I just, so my brain works in weird ways. Uh, so I'm just going to adjust the name of the live stream to talk about uh, device authorization flow. Instead, before I forget to device authorization flow. Let's dive into 
and save. Okay. As the device authorization grant does not require a two-way communication between your OAuth client and device on the device and the user agent, unlike other OAuth 2 grant types, such as authorization code and in-place grant types, it supports several use cases that cannot be served by those other approaches. What I like about RFC is usually they have like this introduction explaining why this is important. So it kind of does a lot of, let's say you were going to research this, you can just like read part of the RFC and understand why this is important. Instead of interacting directly with the end user, user agent, like a browser, uh, the device client instructs the end user to use another computer or device and connect the authorization server to approve access requests. Uh, one thing that I was thinking is, for example, you might have seen these kind of things while coding when you are uh, authenticating to your CLIs, for example, that you need to have grant access to something. So sometimes you're going to, like say in the terminal, you're going to give the credentials in the terminal and everything else that you might need, and then it's going to direct you to a web browser or continue on your phone or something. Since the protocol supports clients that can be uh, that can receive incoming requests, clients pull the authorization uh, server repeatedly until the end user completes the approval request. Okay. So this diagram is the same diagram that we have here. I prefer to look at this one, but I realize that this might be not easy to read, probably. Well, let's zoom in a little bit. So how does it work? So the user is the device app. The device app uh, makes authorization requests to the OAuth device code. So this is different from the OAuth slash token that we were using before uh, in the out zero tenant. So I was doing exactly that. I was, well, similar to that. I was thinking of what we had before with the access token from uh, out zero tenant. Now, instead of using OAuth slash token for getting the access token, we would, would use OAuth slash device slash code. The out zero tenant will reply instead of an access token, a device code, a user code, and a verification URL. The app, in this case, the primary running badge, will go back and give the user code and verification URL. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the device app will continue to pull access token from that OAuth token endpoint that we already know and love. And it keeps waiting from to see if the user is uh, authorized, has authorized. So in while this is happening, the user on their mobile or their computer is going to go to the verification URL, enter the code, think of like, you know, a sequence of digits. Uh, redirect the login authorization prompt, authenticate and consent, probably use, put some information in there if they need to, and mark the device as authorized. And then uh, the out zero tenant is going to give back the access token finally. Request the user data with access token. That's the app that can do that, and then give a response. Okay. So the user starts the app, this is basically what I just said. The user starts on the app of the device uh, and then the device requests the device code, blah, blah, blah. We already seen this. The device app begins calling, begins pulling from out zero authorization server for an OAuth token and calls like this. But we also have the browser flow here. That's the part that it was in blue. Um, and then that is information. The easiest way to implement the device authorization flows is to follow the tutorial. Oh my God, all zero documentation folks, you're all so great. And it's not because I work here. I just love working here because I can do this kind of things and you know, see, oh, the people I work with, that's so good. Thank you. Call your API using device authorization flow. Exactly what I needed. Oh, who was the guest? <laughs> This tutorial will help you call your own API from an input constraint device using device authorization flow. Oh my God, thank you. That's what I needed. Mm -hmm. So Azure makes easy, authentication API, keep reading to learn how to call your API directly. Prerequisites, okay, that's what we need. Requisites, requisites. My brain's not functioning. Ah, 
requisites. I think it's requ prerequisites. Yeah, it sounds better than requisites. Requisites doesn't sound like a real word. Before somebody please correct me, my correct my English. <laughs> Before beginning this tutorial, check limitations below to make sure that your device flow is suitable for your implementation. Okay, where are the limitations? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, look, there is a QR code somewhere. Maybe we can use that and put the QR code in the badge. Request tokens, limitations, limitations, where are you? Receive tokens, call API. Can I? Limitations to use device flow, um, to use authorization, device authorization flow. Oh my God. Device must support server name indication as you need when customers are made and use, have all zero application type of native, have token and point authentication method set to none, be OIDC conformant, not be created to dynamic client registration. Okay. In addition, the device authorization flow does not allow social connections, fine, using out zero developer keys, unless you're using new universal login experience. Oh, so this is specifically to out zero. So for example, let's say you want to provide a way for people to say, oh, I want to log in with Google, or I want to log in with Twitter, or well, X now, I want to log in with LinkedIn or whatever. Uh, you can do that, but you cannot be using the out zero developer keys unless you are using the new name. So there is two universal logins experiences within Not Zero. That is the classic, and that is the new universal login experience. By default, if you create your new account right now, um, you are going to be already set up to use the, uni the new universal login experience, so you're good to go. But if by any chance, let's say you wanna do something with the classic one, uh, you might not be able to use social connections with the zero developer keys. You need to generate your own keys from the platforms. Hi, Cory. So Cory is saying, uh, interesting. Yes, we are learning new things today, Cory. <laughs> I almost wish they had said that a little different, but now I understand it after you said it, you explained it. Yes. Um, yeah, it took me a second there too. Like I was like, oh. so you cannot use social connections. And then I saw that, oh, you need to have the universal uh, login experience. So I'm going to give you an example. So a, a colleague uh, of mine was actually using the classic one because they wanted to use, I guess it was passwordless and for their login. And the passwordless right now is by using the classic one. Um, and so, for example, in that case, see, uh, the they would have to have not not use the developer keys. They would have to have their own keys for uh, for social connections, right? Uh, carry string parameters, but it's just a matter like of configuration, and we have documentation for that too, I guess. Uh, carry string parameters to be accessed from hosted login page or rules. Okay. I guess we, I'm not sure. So all of these parts, I, I don't know. I need to double check. But I, my guess is we all comply with all of these ones. So support server name indication when custom does main I use. I guess we check. Have an out zero application type of native. I guess we can check that too. Have a token endpoint authentication method set to none. Um, Set to none. Yeah, okay. BOIDC conformant, okay. Not be created through dynamic client registration. I don't think we are created by dynamic client registration. Dynamic client application registration disabled for all tenants by default. Okay, so it makes sense. I never, uh, 
I never enabled this, so yeah, we're not. It's not our case. Good. That was easy to figure out. <laughs> Have a token endpoint authentication method set to none. Token endpoint authentication method on the applications page. Uh, let's go look at application the list. Da -da -da. So this is basically the documentation about the dashboard on Alt Zero. So you can either look through this or you know scroll through the dashboard if you know where you're going. Application properties. What was the one token? Uh, not this one. Token in the point of authentication. Can I token and endpoint? Uh, I couldn't find it. Token and point authentication. Interesting. Good to know. Token point B adder. Why do you see conformant? Okay, I guess most of those configurations there are already by default the configurations we need to have because I don't remember changing all of any of them before for the, my tenant in particular. Let's assume we check all of these. If not, we'll probably get an error and then we figure out then, okay? Uh, so, actually, pro tip, I know for a fact we can use the badges for device flow. And why is that? Because I have a colleague that has been using exactly the same badge for device flow on, on his own, on his demonstrations. Uh, so Luis Santos that worked with me he in Canada, um, as part of the pre-sales team, he does demonstrations often uh, to prospective clients, and he has been using the badge. I said to Luis, hey, send me the code you've been using, I wanna check it out, but he's off this weekend. Uh, and so I said, why not take my own time and go through this process, learn a little bit, bit more, and then I can just investigate his code in case mine fails, which, you know, is bound to happen since we're learning something new. Um, and, and he was like, yeah, sure, I can send it to you Monday. And I was like, great. Uh, Monday, mind you, I'll be traveling to Japan for Developer Day Japan. <laughs> and Python APEC. I'm very happy to meet Pythonistas all over the world this year. It's so uh, amazing. But uh, that means that I'll have some time in my flight on Monday that I can, you know, check this out because why not? Uh, and in the meantime, I want to check it out for my own because you know, I particularly learn more when I'm implementing the things. So let's, let's implement it. Let's implement it. Okay. So device flow, how it works, device flow, blah, blah, blah. These are the, the flow steps, how to implement it. The easy way to implement device flow is follow the tutorial. Oh, I closed the tab for the tutorial. Oh, I went back. Okay. So prerequisites. Okay. Limitations checked. Uh, what is used to the application without zero? We will, oh, okay. So we want an application type native. Let's go to my out zero dashboard. Where is it? I haven't opened it yet which makes sense. I'm going to close the tab for the RFC. Uh, if I can, I can refer back to it later. I'm going to close this tab because I don't need it now. And then manage.out0.com. And before I do login, give me one second because I want to make sure that there is nothing like sensitive that I cannot show when I log in. I'll be right back.
Hello. <laughs> wrong scene, Jessica. Wrong scene. This is the one that I want. So I logged into my account. This is my development tenant. You can see here that I have a few uh, applications. Each of these icons means something different. So uh, this little graph is a machine to machine application. So basically an API. This little brown one are uh, web applications. So a regular application, uh, usually when you are building like a Django web app or a Flask web app would be a regular application. You can have single page applications, um, which are, let's say mainly JavaScript, uh, one page applications. I was doing a passwordless test. That's how much I learned about uh, the class and the classic, uh, universal login and the password last thing. Uh, that's why I know it. And the other type of application is this one, the native application that I don't have yet. So this is going to be a new one for me. Yay. So these are the types of applications that are mobile applications. Let's say something on your phone, a desktop application in the CLI, uh, let's say something that runs completely on your computer or CLI that is like something on the terminal actually. Thinking about this just reminded me that Juan, um, Juan, Juan Cruz Martinez, Juan Martinez that worked with me already did a blog post on a CLI uh, device flow. Actually, let me see if I can find it. CLI device flow one out zero blog. And I know I use Google to find the things that I need. So actually, actually, that is a securing Python CLI application without zero. And I actually read a little bit, like I screamed through it a little bit. So this uh, blog post does exactly what we need to do, but instead of using the, um, the badge uses a CLI application. So something that runs on your terminal when you, uh, you know, code in it. Uh, I even going to paste this thing here in case you want to check it out paste there you go so it talks about the authorization flow which i have read before how it works and it walks you through building a cli application using python so it creates a a folder a diction dictionary, no, a directory, <laughs> uh, it uses Python three keys an environment activates that Python environment, install the Python applications. He using out zero Python, which is the out zero Python SDK. Uh, we're probably going to use that too. I'm going to double check. And then it creates a main.py file that does something and basically is an app comment. And here is using the out zero Python uh, SDK to do token verification, asymmetric signature verifier, and so on. You're probably going, we are probably going to see this, I think. Uh, I'm going to double check soon, as long as we, as soon as we start working through the process of implementing our own. So register for our zero account. I already have my account, I just logged in. And then hash to the application that zero, which we are going to do right now. So instead of awesome CLI, we're going to probably call it something like, you know, Badger, blah, blah, blah. And you may be wondering, Jessica, why are you doing this? Other than the fact that I want to give a talk, I might want to do something similar as this blog post, but a blog post for people that use Primaroni and want to use Primaroni to do, you know, device flow. Uh, for the uh, applications. So instead of calling it my app, because you know, better to have a better name, Badger uh, device auth. Yeah, I can change the name later. So I'm going to keep it like this. If I come up with a better name, I can do it uh, after. Mm -hmm. Create. Nice. So now we have two resources that we can take a look at, which is interesting. So once you create an application in R0, in case you haven't seen this before uh, or never did this before, if you create an application, is going to provide you with the SDKs we have available, and we have a bunch of them. We have .NET, Android, React Native, 
blah, blah, blah. And you can see that here we have device authorization flow, which I'm pretty sure that's the one that we are going to use. I'm not sure. Uh, after quick start page apps appears, check the settings tab. Okay, once there, scroll near to the bottom, advanced settings, click on the chevron. I don't know how to pronounce this word, chevron. Chevron is very weird to me. It has uh, sounds that doesn't make sense in my head. To expand it, next click the OAuth tab, ensure OIDC conformant is on, is on the on position. Oh, remember that one that we need to do, which is limitations. So let's go that settings. Where, -da -da. Where what, what part do we need? Refresh tokens, advanced. Application device settings. I just read the thing and I don't remember anymore. Uh, advanced settings, OAuth. Okay, OAuth. Thank you. Wrong tab. Now OIDC conformant is on. It is on by default. Okay, since I didn't change anything, I don't need to save. Then select green types on tab and device code. Yes, dot so. Green types, device code. Oh, look, password MFA. Oh, interesting. I guess we probably need to deselect authorization code, I would say. Maybe, don't remember. Uh, zero provides the full settings for the random generated codes, but if you need, you can customize them and define your patterns on device user code settings. Oh, interesting. Let's check it out. I'm curious. What are the configurations I can have? Device codes use the format. Base, base training, use the code mask. Oh, gotcha. Interesting. Can I find this in the application? In the settings? Is it settings? Advanced. Oh, look here, device code user format code mask. I could have, so base, base 20 or digits. And so this is probably going to be letters dash other letters like this one. Or I could have digits, which would be numbers dash numbers dash numbers. Ah, cute. Which one do I like the most? Letters or numbers? Letters, numbers, letters, numbers. I guess I'll leave with the letters uh, just because it was the default one. And then we can change it up and see what it looks like after we made it work for the first time. What time is that? Okay, so we still have... Well, I wanted to finish this live stream today at 11-ish. Let's see if we can make um, this work. So select an application of type native, done. If necessary, set allowed web engines. I don't think it's necessary for our case. Did Juan need for his? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think we need either. Okay. I guess this interesting. We might need to have localhost in there, but I'll, I'll check it out later. If it doesn't work, that could be one of the reasons why. Make sure the application going types are device include device code done. If you want the application to be able to use refresh tokens, make sure application green types include refresh tokens. To learn how to update grant types, I'm not going to focus on refresh tokens right now. I just need to make it work. We can figure out refresh tokens later. Set up and enable at least one connection for the application. Database connections, social connections, database, database connection. 
usually it comes with a database by default, if I'm not mistaken. Let's double check. Connections. Yes, database username password authentication. Good. I could enable Google OAuth too. But ah, let me show you something too. Let me show you the it make sure that I have the classic uh, the new universal login set up because I was messing it up. So important notice here. Uh, all of my applications are in the same tenant. Usually I don't have a lot of applications running uh, that need to be in a different tenant and separated, but since they're in the same tenant, they are all going to use the same type of login flow and the same type of uh, login experience. And because of that, I selected uh, the classic login experience before because I was testing out that single page application password last thing. And I need to go back to the universal login experience, the new one. So I'm going to enable this one to allow me to use social connections with the out zero development keys instead. Remember, we read that to the documentation. I knew that was, that was important somewhere. We got it. So now I'm using the un branded universal login experience. I could change all of this if I wanted to, like I could put a different logo. What is the link for my, I could put like my profile photo if I wanted to, just to have fun, but I'm not going, I'm going to leave it there at it as it is now and go to applications again and go to this one and what I was doing, oh, database connections. And now I can enable Google OAuth too. And I probably will do that just cause and I will de-enable password last because I don't want password last for this one. Because I cannot have password last with the new login experience right now. Okay. So now I can log in with Google. Yay. It was that easy. Good. Resist your, your API without zero. If you want to API to receive refresh tokens to allow to obtain your tokens. Da -da -da. Enable allow offline access. To learn more about refresh tokens, read refresh tokens. So my next step after I figure out device flow is probably going to do refresh tokens and offline access. But one thing at a time, right? Focus on device flow. Configure the device user code settings to define character set, format, length. If your random generated of your random generated user code, okay. Authorize user, call API, blah, 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 request device code. Okay, we can test this out on the terminal first, right? Can't we? We can, right? We can even use the code in Python. I can use URL easier, probably. Login to go. Oh, okay. I have, oh, I thought I had logged in before. Good to know. Let me change the tenant to the one that I was using. Okay. And here I can select the application and it's going to be the one that I want, Badger. Okay, now I have all the information from my Badger here, client ID, scope audience whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, now I'm going back to uh, um, Juan's blog post just because, you know, make the best of our time. Request the device code. During this step, you use Azure API to initiate the device authorization flow, provide us with a step URL user code needed to authenticate and validate the device. So we'll have to get data from the Azure dashboard to call the required API. So let's get them and set them up in our applied environments like this. Okay, so now we go back to coding. Let's go back to Tony. Oh, wrong place. Tony, 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 Tony. I'm going to stop this. 
I'm going to close this and I'm going to create another script in here. And I'm going to call it device flow. Does that sound good? My creativity is terrible today. Uh, device flow dot UI. Okay. All right. Oh, that is a way for us to install a library when you're going to use the auth0 um, library, remember? Uh, probably I should copy that code and install the library. Yes. I'm going to copy this. I'm also going to copy um, my JWT uh, the PI, that part that reads the L0 config uh, thingy. Just because I don't want to go through this process again. It's already done. I know it works. And I'm going to change it a little bit so that the default text is... I'm going to change this also. I'm going to change it to... Out zero device flow, and then I need to create this file after. So domain. First, I want the domain. Second, I want this, and last, I want algorithm. And I don't need print type right now. I also don't need this right now, I think. And this is going to be inside of that get data. Um, I just realized that this comment is wrong. It's not four lines. Reading the next line. I don't have to keep updating every time I change this the format of my file. So out zero config is going to be I'm going to keep the same name just to make it like the code shorter. Reline and reline and read line again. And I'm going to this is a list, but I'm going to keep read line like that and will I need this as a dictionary I don't know I don't know domain client ID probably yes and algorithms in no grant type thank you very much And I'm going to do this because everything will be a line. This strip on the end here is just to make sure that I don't have like a break line on the end, just in case. Um, so clean up a little bit of the, the file. And this doesn't work because this is going to be a list, not a string. Oh, I could do that differently. Yeah, let's do that different. Let's do this like this and do this like this. Actually, I prefer to have like this list using the method for um, the function for it. Okay, save device flow. I need to create this file too. New file. Um, save file to RP. Okay, so this is not. Uh, Terribly important. 
so I can probably put this information in here um, and show to all of you. I already did once, right? When I was logging in here. Yes. So this is going to be my domain. This is going to be my client ID. Uh, one thing that I will do is recreate this application after I log off from the live stream, uh, just so that you don't have that information there. Because I cannot, I think I cannot change the client ID after the application is created. So the way to have a new client ID is creating a new application. Can I try doing this first? Let's check it out that later. So what is that main that um, one did first here? Okay. The main client ID. So let's see the same thing in our application dashboard settings domain that is the one that I have just in Parada us .com. client ID this is the one good and then let's create a new login function to add our code okay oh so you already we're going to need that um, that thing I'm going to copy this copy this inside Tony. Uh, let me take the time to say thank you Juan for having writing for having written this great blog post. Uh, so this is our first function. We have this request data available as a global variable so we can use that instead of that other device code payload here. We can use here I can use this thing and call the what was Jesus client ID right client ID client ID uh huh device code format out zero domain and this I'm going to change to request data out uh, domain data device payload I'm going to and this is not request it's your requests from JWT we already learned that we have you JSON and you requests, which works kind of the same way. I'm going to break this into different lines just because I think it's easier to read. And follow kind of the same format that's in here before. So if the status code is different than 200, error. Uh, device code successful. Okay, let's let's try to run this. Let's see if it works. I don't see why not. We are not anything. Well, I need to actually call this function right somewhere. Login. And this is not going to change anything on the screen of the device as yet. I'm just doing the thing on the my shell. All zero request data isn't defined. Ooh. All zero request data. Oh yeah. No, here. Oh, because I didn't call this function. The silly me. Get data. Okay, let's try again. Your request isn't I didn't import your request. Oh my god. I promise, I usually am a good, a good coder. 
I just forget stuff very frequently. <laughs> okay, now it's going. So it's rebooting buffer protocol uh, one line. Oh, I guess we had the same problem before, right? Where we were using requests, post. Line 184, line 182 of your request.py, line 60, line 44. So this one, what did I do different this time? Let's take it out. Cha -cha -cha. So URL, is a URL? Data, oh. We're missing this part, remember? Oh, yes, let's import your JSON. Import your JSON. So the data needs to be a certain type of object for these things to work. And we need to do your JSON dumps my dictionary in order for it to work. Good. Progress. See, that's why we try to do the things that we know how to do, and then we have uh, things. Uh, happen to us. So I'm going to I'm going to actually I don't want to use typer right now because I don't know what the typer version of MicroPython is. Uh, so I'm going to just leave it there. So what? Why one was using typer here was just to break the function and give the error out and not go through uh, all of this with else's and whatnot. So I'm going to, since this is a function, I'm going to do hit turn here uh, and be happy about it because I don't have typer yet. And I guess that's fine. Error generating code, device code. Oh my God, good. So something happened and we've fallen into here. And it could be for a number of reasons. It could be because, for example, we don't have, what is the name? The local house setup in the allowed web origins or something. So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do. Can I print out this thing? Okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get this function in here. And now get all of this other code in here as well. So one of the things that I find really helpful about Thony is that since you have a shell here so easily to spot, you can actually start coding right here to test things out. And I'm going to import the things I need to import. So basically, as I would any Python shell on my normal terminal, I could just code in here and try to figure out what's going on. So let's do get data first. And that apparently worked. Um, we should be able to see this information here now. Oh, nope, nope. Yep, it's a dictionary, good. Oh, I don't have algorithms. Is that why? It could be why. Oh, God dang it. Interesting. <laughs> Jesus. Oh. I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case, okay? I'll go. Can I just copy paste? It's so much easier. I have a problem with this word. Is the TH always gets me. And my keyboard is blinking at me like crazy, telling me that it's going to be without power soon. And I don't have anything that I can power it with. Let's run this again. So algorithm is empty as expected. Why is it empty though? Everything else red. Didn't I put an algorithm in the file? Oh, I didn't. That's why. <laughs> yeah, my problem with the keyboard is I forgot 
uh, to charge it this night. And I forgot that I had a live stream today. Uh -huh. And so I'm leaving dangerously. You know? Like Simba, I laugh in the face of danger. Danger. RS 256. Let's see if now it works. Okay. I'm confident it will work. Let's go. It worked. So algorithms is here. Yes. Now we can figure out what is going on with the generation codes. So one thing down, <laughs> one bug down, nine, nine to go. Just to get exiled like Simba did too. Oh no, I don't, pre I don't want to. Now I'm going to have all the Simba songs in my head. Jesus. And I know the Simba songs in Portuguese. So if I start singing in Portuguese, that's why. Oh my God, is a path. Um, there's, you cannot go back from uh, starting thinking about Disney and not have songs in your head. Okay, so since this is not working, let's go back to my previous approach where we copy the code and you try to figure out slowly what is going on. Okay, this first. So get data was working. Now it wasn't working, now it is probably. And if I look at this fast data, everything checks out. Oh. It's a me problem, you know, it's a me problem. <gasps> okay, so Python has this weird behavior sometimes. I'm going to explain. Let's see if I can reproduce this. Um, okay, let's, let's see, let's see. I'm going to open a terminal first. Ah, oh my God, turn, turn me now up. Um, Python 3. So here I'm running Python 3.9. Okay, it's not MicroPython, but it's going to follow the same idea, I, I would say. So if I have a string that says some text like jazz, and if I do a list of that text, Python does this to me. And I don't particularly understand why, but I know this happens and I completely forgot, you know, because life, <laughs> weird behavior, sometimes those happen. That is a reason, uh, but I don't remember. I didn't remember that it happened. Uh, so how can I make this into a list without breaking it, it a, a part? Yes. So. I like to use this thing, but sometimes it doesn't work and I never know why. It's just very annoying. So let's try to do this again. Come on, Python. Be nice to me. Let's get data. Get data. And all zero request data should be right now. Okay, thank the Lord. Now, let's try to run this script once again. See if that works. Error. Okay, so the reasons I knew could be wrong, uh, probably not wrong anymore. Could it be that this is because this is not a string of a list? Or do we need a list list? Where is the documentation? All zero documentation. Uh, no, here. No, this is a list list. It's not like a string list. Okay. Oh my God, I need to stop. 
Okay, now let's try figure out what what is going on. Oh no, wrong 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 shortcut. Oh. Okay, I know there is an error. I I know, I know. Don't you worry. Let's let's see if we can figure out why though. Okay, so the first part is working good. And now what I'm going to do is break it, break down this this pieces of code inside of this function into something that is not inside of a function. Just to make it easier for the bugging in here, I don't usually have Jesus, I miss my VS code sometimes. I don't need the sprint. I know this is working. Uh, so let's do this. Device code payload is that dictionary, and let's try to do the request now, so we can investigate what is what 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 is happening here. Device code. I don't remember particularly the API for requests from your requests. My guess is similar to the request library. Uh, but so this is a response object. Yes. And what I want is text. Let's do text first. Unauthorized, unauthorized, unknown client. Okay. Unauthorized, unknown client. Is something else that I should be doing that I'm not doing? Is that it? It could be. Reason. Forbidden. The. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having too much fun with this content. Yeah, it's going to be the same thing. It's not going to be very helpful, which kind of makes sense. We don't want to give too many clues or what went wrong if this is like somebody hacking, you know, something. After calling the Zero device code the API, we get a JSON object response that among other properties contain contains, no, it doesn't. <laughs> my i did something wrong so probably i'm the prob probably i'm the problem yes it's me i'm the problem it's me uh okay so let's figure out what we did differently from all of these things here because even though juan is doing in this blog post something different that i'm doing because i'm running through tony not to have um script on my machine everything should be kind of the same thing uh, because it's just a different you know applications create create application okay we did that enter the name of the application i did that select native and click create we did that after a quick start page appears go to the settings app once there scroll near the bottom to the section name advanced settings and click the you know, arrow down to expand it. I already did. OAuth tab, ensure OADC conformant is on and they should be on by default if it just created the application. That's true, it's, it's on, We've, we checked. Select green types tab, and did I not save? I could have not saved. It could be a me problem. Let's see. Advanced settings, OAuth, so OIDC conformance is already there. Green types. Oh, Jessica, why you do this? Save changes. Found the problem. <laughs> this could be the problem. Let's let's try making the request again and see if it works now. Uh, yeah, I know. Like so, 
Okay, let me let me explain what went on in my head there. Can I close this? Yes. So the way that I I code and some other people that I know code is like this. If you get the code and the code is the same code that you had before and it worked, so you'll have to check your premises. So something you did wrong before that you thought you didn't do wrong needs to be double checked, right? So in my head, I have done everything right. I copied the code, the code was the same, but it wasn't. Well, the code was the same, but there was something before the code that was a problem. So now we know that the problem was me not saving it. It's a user problem, not a coding problem. Uh, let's try doing the request again. Let's see if that works. And notice I'm not running this the the script. It's just because I want to test this out first. Response object and let's see do content. Let's do content. Error unauthorized again. So maybe it was not that. Mm. Can I double check this just to make sure that this is this is formatting as it should. It is. Okay. Off device code. Good. Could it be something here on the JSON dumps device code payload? It could. Right? So I saved it. Did, now I'm going to triple check that I saved. It is there. Good. Can I refresh this page just in case? <laughs> um, so uh, we went through a lot of configuration and it, we could have done something wrong in the, in the configuration. It's, it, it's totally fine. It's totally doable. So it's safe now. So good. Using password MFA is client finishes going da, da, da. Okay, good. Token point of math other than none. Mm, okay. So now we know that token point of method is none because I can not even enable client credentials here. Good. Which was one of the limitations that we had read on the documentation for limitation list. Okay, so I remember the other thing that we saw that could be a problem was the allowed go back. Uh, allowed uh, one of these URLs. I, I think as a logout, if my brain serves me well. Select brain types tab, check device code. It, it is unchecked by default. Ensure the device code is checked. Okay, done. Finally, click save change button. That was the step that I did not do the first time. Default settings for random generating codes. Okay, done. As you mentioned, device code for requires series of steps in your case, implement the full, then the follow logical order. Request device code. Request tokens, receive tokens. So request device code. During this step, you use out zero API to initiate device authorization flow. Provide us with the step your a setup step. A setup URL and use a code needed to authenticate and validate the device. We have to get data from the out zero dashboard to call required API. So let's get them and set them as Python variables like this. All right. To capture the out zero domain client ID, go to the dashboard, copy that. Okay, so probably I should double check that mine, not this one, my client ID, my client domain are correct, right? So domain first. Um, so domain. And then client ID. Okay. And this is RS two fifty six. Okay. 
Okay, save. Let's rerun the code. Client ID, domain, algorithms, correct. We, we are not using algorithms now, but okay. To capture setting step, both values should be available in the screen. Please copy paste them into corresponding variables. Now let's create login function and add our code. So run the device authorization flow. Device code payload client ID is scope. I want the scope to be this one. Open ID profile. Sorry about that. Device code response requests dot post. Out zero domain. We already checked this. This is right. Data is going to be the device code payload. This one. If something is different than 200, okay, print out an error. We are doing everything right, apparently. Maybe it could be where the thing is running. Can we try doing the CURL? Maybe we can try doing this first. Yep, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to exit Python. I'm going to run this URL. So this works. And we basically did the same thing, right? Okay, good. We, we It is working. So we got the device code. We got the user code. Good. Let me spin this to make it easier to read. So we did this URL, the same one from the documentation. We ran through, we made the request to this thing. Okay, let's try that again. So we got the code back. So it's not configuration. Configuration is working. It's a matter of figuring out the requests from the MicroPython that is wonky. And if I remember correctly, there were two different ways that we could do requests and pass along the JSON object uh in here and it could be that yes exactly that's my point maybe this is to be the other perm let's open up the documentation again just to double check your requests so you request request data optional dictionary top of list will be coded by class file object in the request body, the other this optional JSON data sending the request body in headers. Are we supposed to be doing a post, right? We did a post <laughs> at this time. I already, you know, when you are trying to find something in your home and then you start opening all of the doors to places that makes no sense that the thing that you were looking for is in there. That's what I'm doing right now. You know, open the fridge or something. Seems like your post body is inaccurate. Well, and they did a form post, not a JSON post in this URL request. Yes, exactly. That's that's what I'm trying to figure out now. What is the difference? Because the thing is, the only difference from what we are doing to what one did in the blog post was the request library that they were using. So we are using the view request, which is MicroPython, and Juan was using requests, which is another library. So we, this is your requests, and Juan was using requests, Python, which is this other one here. What is the homepage documentation? So this is requests. Uh, then there are other libraries in Python you can use to make uh, requests. Um, requests is one of them. There's another one that I really like, which is HTTPX, Python. Uh, this one, I really like this one too. I, I It feels lighter to me than request does for some reason. Um, so now I'm trying to compare the difference in between the CRL, the request that one did in the blog post, and 
the request that I was, as do, was doing from MicroPython using new requests. So that's basically figuring out what is the part of the API for the post request that makes sense. And we had the same problem before once uh, a few live, live stream back. Um, we had to figure out because we did JSON first. So that's the problem. Anyway, can you trace also oh, Kari said this, uh, can you trace the request being sent from the MicroPython to see what actually is being sent out? No, not that I know. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to figure out right now. If the request it, so there are a few ways that you can do a request, like in request, actually, you can set up the request, put all the information in, and then make the post or get or put request or whichever method you want. The other way is just make the request directly and save the response. And one thing that I notice here is I don't necessarily know how to make the setup inside your request. I don't think it has a way to do it uh, because usually when I'm debugging locally from the other libraries, there is a way for setting up the request before making the request. And then you can double check if everything is in the correct place. So what I'm going to do is see if I can grab that request before getting an actual response. Sometimes the API for the library lets you do that. Oh, who is it? Hi, thank you for the follow. Uh, HS Anzol, Anzol. I don't know how, is, did, did I pronounce that right? Uh, if I didn't, let me know. I'll make a, I'll try again <laughs> and try to make it better, <laughs> promise. Uh, okay, so we did the request. We know this one did the work. So we know that it was an unauthorized. Can I, mm, let me do something before. Can I do this? and see what happens. So this is a string. Is this? Oh my God, stop it. How many times do I need to click something wrong to stop clicking the thing wrong? Three times, that's the number. So client ID uh, is right. Everything is not string as a JSON object, okay. Another thing that we can do instead of data, data, try to use JSON and see if that works. Both of them should go in the body of the request. Invalid JSON. Okay. Interesting. I'm having fun fighting the code. A little bit. Invalid JSON? What? <laughs> curiouser and curiouser. My brain is processing. If anybody has any ideas what could be, I be doing wrong, I would love to hear about it. And I probably should do a blog post about this once I figure out uh, why things are going wrong. And I don't want to go down the rabbit hole that I usually do go down, which is checking the code in GitHub of the library to see if I can understand why the thing is going on because I, that could take me hours and I forget about time and it's already 11 and a half. And sometimes I'm going to start be, uh, getting hungry, which is never good. Debugging and being hungry at the same time is never a good thing. <laughs> at least not for me. Okay, so not the JSON one. 
So let's go back to data. Data was actually not breaking before making the request. Data. But it was invalid. How can I get? Oops. Sorry, I moved my microphone because my fr in front of me. Oh. Maybe I should just do another thing. It could be. Tell me, Kari. Tell me. Oh my God, could we have figured out, Kari? Can you see the post requests in the Alt Zero dashboard? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think I, I, I probably can because it's giving this unauthorized or unknown client. Um, let's see if I can. I don't remember. How can I? Okay, pause for a second there. Where, where do I go again to see the requests? Oh my God, it has been a while since I did this. Lux, oh, found it. Okay, da -da. so this was the one that was right from this URL. Get a client, blah, 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 client secret. Oh, interesting. I guess this is the one that went right, right? 15 minutes ago. Yes. This is the one that just failed two minutes ago. So this is the response that we got. Unauthorized unknown client, unauthorized client, OAuth authorization, raw. Jesus, stop, quit, log ID, false, user agent, order another. Hmm. What is the difference between this one and the other one? Makes me think you are missing an access. That's my my problem. It shouldn't be missing anything. Let's do this URL again and let's see if it gets here. Right, first, first and foremost, let's get that one that works. Okay, and let's refresh this page. It takes a little while for the log to show up. Ah. Nope. Wrong button. What the hell? Am I? Now I, I, I'm confused. Am I making the call to the right place? I think I am, right? I'm starting to doubt my, even my own name. This was one that failed four minutes ago. Which one was this one? The one before that. Which one was this one? This is not what I think it is. This is something else. Storage log above actions taken the dashboard by administrator and authentication made by your users. Oh, so these are not, some of these are not the one that I'm thinking. API operation, which one is this one? So this one is being from Badger device auth. Okay, this is a good sign. This, I guess this is this URL that worked.
native. See, this is the URL that worked. Algorithm. Blah, 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 blah. This is the response that we got. Client ID. Weird and weird. Okay, so these are all the operations. So for example, an hour ago, I was probably setting up the um, application. So everything that I do in the dashboard actually comes to this log, not only the request that I'm doing from terminal and whatnot. interesting okay i think i'm going to stop here we did part of the job today was a long day already <laughs> it is, it's not even lunchtime yet anyways uh i'm going to stop here i'm going to give it time and then figure out what went wrong with this request later uh if i figure out i will come back to a live stream uh, either next week or the week after that. So next week, I'm going to be at PyCon APAC. Uh, and I'm going to be in Japan with Dyson. Uh, we are going to be at PyCon APAC. So if you are by any chance in Japan uh, and you are going to PyCon APAC, come and say hi. Uh, I'm, uh, Corey just said, I'm definitely curious to see the solution. Like, me too. Uh, so I'm going to figure out that. Uh, now it's a matter of honor. I have to figure out what is going wrong, uh, and it, and I'm pretty sure it's something related to the the what is it there? the library that we are using for making the request. It's just a matter of figuring out how to actually use it properly to make it construct the request that we want in the right way. So next week, PyCon is back. Uh, if you see me or Dyson, please say hi. I would love to meet you if you're there. Also, we have Developer Day Japan. So if you are in Japan and when it comes to Developer Day, uh, we have... <laughs> okay, oi, Anzol. Uh, so Anzol is saying that it is Anzol mesmo in, in Portuguese. Uh, so he's Brazilian probably. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, actually, for the Brazilians in the live stream, I'm going to be doing a second live stream today at the end of the day around 6.30 Brazilian time. This one is going to be in Portuguese. It's going to be about Hacktoberfest and it's going to be in the GitHub Brazil um, channel. So I'm looking forward to, you know, talking a little bit about open source with people over there. Uh, so Anzol, uh, going to say in Portuguese real quick. Se você estiver disponível e quiser se juntar, vai ser ótimo. Eu vou tentar transmitir para os dois canais ao mesmo tempo. Uh, so I basically just said that uh, if you people want to come and join, would be great. And I'm going to try to uh, do the live stream in both channels, my channel and GitHub Brazil's channel at the same time. Let's see if I can man make uh, StreamYard do what I want it to do. Uh, but anyways, yeah, so today is going to be a... Is go I'm going to stop here. Um, it's better to stop and give it time and have a break, you know, have a snack, probably eat something and then try to debug it again. Uh, if I figure out the answer, uh, I will try to do a live stream, uh, not next week because I'm coming back from Japan next week and I'm going to be in PyCon back, but the week after that, uh, before I go to GitHub Universe, ah, which is the next event after PyCon back. So I'm looking forward to figuring this out uh, with you all and see you soon. Bye. And